Hi, and welcome to the show. Subscribe at kevinemdy.com slash podcast. Get CME for this episode by clicking on the CME link in the show notes. Today, we welcome Brian Jackson. He's a pathologist. His Kevin MD article is titled, Why HIPAA Isn't Enough to Protect Your Health Data. Brian, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you. Pleased to be here. We'll get into your article in a little bit. First off, briefly share your story and journey to where you are today. So like, like a lot of doctors, I grew up around healthcare. My dad was a pharmacist, and so grew up around the hospital in Salt Lake City. And then I was really interested in computers back in the 80s. And so I ended up working in high school and then during college in the informatics department at Intermountain Healthcare, sure. where they had a, you know, a homegrown electronic health record system. And that was a lot of fun. So that's what made me want to go to medical school. It wasn't so much about seeing individual patients, but just this realization that healthcare is the most exciting industry in the world and with some of the smartest and most interesting people. And I wanted to be part of that. So that's, that's what got me into medical school. I ended up doing a residency in pathology, then worked in healthcare IT for a couple of years, did a master's in informatics. And then I landed at ARUP Laboratories in Salt Lake City where I've been for the past two decades. Right. So what's what's interesting about ARUP, it's a quite a large labor, medical laboratory business that does testing for hospitals all over the US. It's about 5,000 people employed there, but it's also entirely part of the University of Utah. So it's this hybrid business and academic environment. And so I was able to sort of do IT, do operations, do a bunch of business facing functions and be sort of half an academic and write mm -hmm. papers and go to conferences and then half in a business role in this medical setting. So really just a, a fun, couldn't, couldn't imagine a better place to, to build a career over the last couple of decades. More recently, I, I've taken more or less a sabbatical this mm -hmm. year, stepped away from my full-time academic role to start working on a book proposal and some things on basically the topics we'll be talking about sure. today. So, so I'm here in my in London with my family, awaiting the, the King's coronation at the end of this week and sort of drinking all of that in and just having a great time. Excellent. Now, with your expertise in both medicine and in health informatics, why is that marriage between medicine and health IT, why, why has that been so rocky and difficult? Oh, I could, <laughs> that could be a long answer. It was the IT thing that got me into medicine rather yeah. than rather than the other way around, but it was because there were just, because of what you said, because there seemed to be just such huge opportunities to do things so much better. Medicine is an information profession. I mean, what, what doctors do is mostly about information more than it is about, you know, physical actions and things like that. And historically, medical records just were, you know, being on paper, it was, it was very limited what you could do with them. I think the informatics community made some mistakes back in the 90s and 2000s. I think with the, the push to get everyone onto electronic health record systems as fast as possible, it happened in ways that put all of the, basically put everyone on commercial platforms uh, that were, I'm just going to express an opinion that I don't yeah. think were necessarily the best designed commercial platforms. Sure. And so that industry consolidated much faster than it really should have. And it drove some of the independent efforts like, you know, Intermountain, Vanderbilt, Harvard, you know, Beth Israel Deaconess, and some others that I should be naming that I'm, I'm forgetting. But it sure. sort of drove them out because of the, the way it all consolidated and the regulation came about. So, so that didn't really do us any favors, but hopefully we're making some progress. All right. So we're going to talk about one aspect of of informatics and that intersection between informatics and medicine, which is, of course, patient privacy and HIPAA. Your Kevin MD article is titled, Why HIPAA Isn't Enough to Protect Your Health Data. Now tell us, how did this article come together? So I've had this interest in a long time in the, inter, in the connection between medicine and corporations. Yeah. And, and again, a lot of this was just you know, working in business-facing roles and learning about business theory and taking classes and things. So a couple of years ago, some articles came out in, in the press about Google approaching health systems to acquire medical records. Yeah. And one of the first ones was a, a project that hit the press from UCSF. And then later, some, some bigger 
data acquisitions involving University of Chicago. And the biggest one was the Project Nightingale with the Ascension Health System. Sure. So this was you know, from Wall Street Journal articles. So that got me really thinking about sort of the 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 deal making between healthcare systems and a company like Google yeah. and the ethics of this. Now, it, it turns out that the UCSF contract became public because it was it was acquired by a reporter through the California's Public Records Act. So I read through that and it looked to my eyes like a pretty ethical contract. You know, Google was committing to you know, use this, you know, patient data in ways that that seemed to be responsible. They they were promising to destroy the data at the end of the project, mm -hmm. to not re-identify it, to not share it with any third parties, et cetera, et cetera. So, so there was nothing sort of, you know, there were no big red flags in terms of the wording of the contract. The the concern was the privacy of it. Yeah. Why wasn't that public? Why didn't why didn't UCSF in particular? Now I don't blame Google. Okay, so here's the irony here. Companies like Google, are their whole business model is built on exploiting our private data. Yeah. I think I think people know that. So they they really don't have any respect for private data because their business model you know is antithetical to that, and yet they are incredibly protective of their own corporate privacy. Sure. So I, I I just find that a little bit ironic. So so but because of that, Google does not make these deals public. But why didn't UCSF make it public? Presumably because Google told them not to yeah, and put yeah. pressure, twisted their arm. But, but, but was that really ethical? And then with Project Nightingale and the Ascension Health System, why didn't Ascension executives insist that that be public? Because presumably it was, they were doing, they were well-intentioned. Presumably, you know, they were doing this deal so that Google could could develop useful software that, yeah. that Ascension could then use. So if if the in intentions were good, if there was nothing to hide, why were they hiding it? So, so that got me thinking, and I got a, a, a group of, of like-minded folks together from the American Medical Informatics Association, who I'd met through the, the ethics work group sure. in that group. And we started talking about, you know, could we do a research project around this? And originally, I wanted to go to health system executives and ask for all of their data sharing contracts so that we could analyze their contract language. Yeah. And we quickly discovered that no sure. one was going to share their contracts. So instead, we have been interviewing, just doing structured interviewings, sorry, structured interviews with health system executives to ask about their policies and practices and perspectives and motivations and things like that. And hopefully we'll we'll get something submitted for publication in the coming months. But out of that came we had a lot of internal conversations about HIPAA because one of our one of our main findings was that to many health system leaders and hospital CEOs, HIPAA gets equated with privacy, or I should yeah. say, privacy gets equated with HIPAA. Sure. If if we're complying with HIPAA, which everyone does, and we everyone you know health systems are very good at sure. this. If we're complying with HIPAA, then you know we've checked the box and we're doing everything we need to do to be responsible about privacy. That's yeah. that's the attitude, and it's a problem because HIPAA is an incredibly archaic law in in internet terms. Yeah. So that that was that was the motivation behind behind writing this up. Yeah, and we're seeing a lot of these corporate entities get involved in the healthcare space. You know, you mentioned Google and I want to ask you about Amazon, right? Amazon has their own clinics and they, they are mm -hmm. buying, you know, primary care clinics and they're moving into that primary care space. So tell us what exactly is the privacy risk to patients who engage in services that are intersecting with these corporate entities like Amazon and, and Google? What What is their data privacy risk? So they're, there, there are several ways you can slice this. You know, from a medical ethics standpoint, there, there, there's certainly the the principle of autonomy that all of us should have the right to control our own data, yeah. just the way we have the right to control our own bodies. And so, so whether you what, whether you want to frame that as a risk or not, I mean that I think there's sort of a fundamental expectation out there that a lot of people have. But if you want to talk, you know, actual risks, let me let's. Let me try an example here. So this was a recent news story. 
uh, that came out, it was re reported in Stat News, but I think some other sources as well, that most hospitals in the United States have Google and Meta, Facebook, and other tech companies tracking software built into their websites. Yeah. And now, so in the, the deal here, the, the trade-off basically is that the software is free to the hospital and the, the marketing departments who build the websites. And the software gives you basically free, you know, web statistics on your on your users. So, it, you know, it's, it's useful stuff. And so everyone is incorporated onto their websites. Well, at the back end, what these trackers do is they siphon off user data and send it to, you know, Meta, Facebook, and Google, and whoever it is providing the software, which they then build into their databases for you know search purposes. Sure. Okay. So you know, what is there a risk to the fact that ninety nine percent of hospitals have this on their public websites? Now, hospital execs on interviewed for the news articles basically said, well, there's no risk here because we don't put PHI on our website. Okay. You know, and there are no trackers on the on the patient portals. But but here's a scenario for you. Let's suppose you are a woman in Texas who just found out that you're pregnant and you start searching hospital websites to see which hospitals have abortion services. Mm -hmm. The fact that you are searching the public website for the word abortion is now part of Google's and Facebook's databases. Now, is that going to be discoverable by an aggressive attorney general in, in the state of Texas? Under some scenarios, it possibly could be. Okay, second related scenario, maybe you're not searching for abortion. Maybe you're looking for a substance abuse treatment program, again, offered by a hospital. So now that information is in Google's databases and maybe some other tech company databases. And now suppose that there's a spinoff of Google selling algorithms to HR departments to screen employees for basically you know, candidate screening to see who's going to be a good employee. So that, that algorithm may have now have access to all kinds of personal data on you, including the fact that you were just looking for a substance abuse treatment program at a hospital. And maybe you had an abortion, and maybe you're seeing a psychiatrist. And so, so you can sort of see where these scenarios go. The more that these companies know about you, the more risk there is that that it could be used in all kinds of subtle ways. And with the rise of AI, making decisions about employee screening, about health insurance rates, about life insurance rates, about all kinds of aspects of your life, it does become a real risk. Now, to your knowledge today, have any of those scenarios come to fruition? Have there been any cases or stories of something close to what you just said come true? So I am not aware of of any of those specific scenarios coming through there there so on the algorithm front if you just want to look at like algorithmic bias kinds of stuff there has been a lot of good reporting particularly by ProPublica and particularly in the criminal justice space about how algorithms used by judges to assign sentences can be biased in in lots of bad ways so i'm 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 connecting some dots here but basically you combine the rise of AI and the, the ways in which algorithms are, are coming into our daily life with the fact that these algorithms are going to increasingly have access to big data sets that include all kinds of private information to say that maybe this isn't such a great thing. So let's talk about Amazon. I know Amazon's gotten into that primary care space. They have this product where they can, you know, someone, a practitioner can prescribe medication without really even talking to you. You could fill out a questionnaire. Are these companies, are they, are they bound by any privacy laws? Are you essentially just giving up your private medical data without something close to HIPAA on these corporate entities part? Okay. So I think you're getting into the, the HIPAA covered entity part. So this is a it's a it's one of the major limitations of, of HIPAA law as as originally written. So back in the '90s, when the pre-electronic health record era, HIPAA was written specifically to apply to hospitals, clinics, healthcare workers, insurance companies, and basically clearinghouses between those two. So basically, if you had traditional access to 
health records back in the 90s, then HIPAA was written for you. The boundaries have really gotten blurred. So with Amazon, if Amazon is running a clinic, then that clinic is obviously bound by HIPAA. If Amazon is doing other IT-related services that are sort of meta, that's sort of not actually, they're sort of organizationally separated from the part of Amazon that's running a clinic, then that part of Amazon probably isn't subject to HIPAA. So an example here that, again, has been in the news recently is BetterHelp. Mm -hmm. Not Amazon, but but I think we've all heard ads for better help on, on podcasts sure. or in other places. It's, they've, they've advertised quite aggressively. And their pitch is that they'll match you up with a therapist online, which in principle is a good thing. I mean, there's, there's a lot of need for, for mental health care in the US and a lot of unmet need. And if they can fill some of that by matching people up to therapists, that should be a good thing. So better help was discovered to be selling a lot of their data to Facebook by the same kind of mechanisms we were talking about a few minutes ago. Even though BetterHelp was caught doing that, they have not been hit with a HIPAA-related fine. And that's presumably because they're probably not a HIPAA-covered entity, even though they're in the mental health space. And the reason they're not subject to HIPAA is that they're not actually the organization delivering those services. They're like Uber contracting with private therapists and the private therapists keep their own records and they're subject to HIPAA, but BetterHelp as a company is not. So it's, I think it's a loophole, but anyway, so the, the end of that story was they did get hit with a, a multi-million dollar fine, but it was hit, it was from the FTC for basically false advertising because they, they were claiming in ads to be responsible with privacy and then turning around and not doing it. So, so yeah, it's a good example of how in, in the modern, you know, internet era, not everyone involved in healthcare actually is even subject to HIPAA. So what's the path forward here? Because we're seeing all these tech companies moving to the healthcare space, hoping to disrupt it. Should patients simply just be wary of any tech related healthcare solution? Should they accept the trade-off to their privacy? What do you envision to be the path forward? So I, I think people have sort of accepted loss of privacy because let's face it, you don't, the, the current system doesn't give patients any real control. Even, even HIPAA, what are those forms, those HIPAA disclosures that you sign to go in the hospital, you don't have any real control over whether you sign that or not because they won't treat you if you don't sign it. So, yeah. so patients have basically zero control today. And, and I think at that level, you know, we shouldn't accept, as citizens, we shouldn't accept that as being okay. In terms of, of how things can be changed, you know, clearly uh, federal medical data privacy law needs to be overhauled. It's way overdue. I know there are folks working on it in Congress. I don't know that there's anything close to to actually making it onto the floor for discussion, but but a number of things really need to be be rethought. The, there are some principles from the Europeans GDPR legislation that that might be useful here, but but some of the the key things that really ought to be done differently with HIPAA are first of all, it should apply to everyone, not just healthcare companies. It should be based mainly on misuse of health data rather than disclosure of health data. Because HIPAA, HIPAA is all about disclosure, but it doesn't penalize people downstream for what they actually do with it. Sure. And then the de-identification loophole is an enormous loophole. The fact that, that we've got this, this huge data broker industry in the United States, you know, companies like IQVIA and, and now Truvetta, but, but those aren't the only examples. You know, sharing and selling health data and getting away with it because they strip out names and birth dates and the other identifiers. But all of that data can be re-identified with fairly straightforward technology. So, so the de-identification loophole really needs to go as well. So anyway, so basically my point is we need a complete overhaul of federal law, but I do think there's an additional layer here, which is that healthcare organizations, particularly hospitals, hospitals have a moral and ethical responsibility to their communities. They don't always act 
like it, let's be honest. But but they but they do have that and community and their boards of directors should hold them accountable for that. Hospitals have a lot of purchasing power and a lot of influence if they choose to exert that power in terms of contracts with with suppliers. And I think hospitals could do a lot to hold IT companies and other kinds of, of external companies that they contract with accountable for these kinds of things. And my final question, Brian, tell us some of your take home messages that you want to leave with the Kevin MD audience. So the, the big take home message that I'd like to leave people with are that the, the rise of corporations in healthcare, we, we've all seen it. We've all experienced it. It's real. It's not going to go away. We need to develop better ways to hold corporations accountable to the same ethical principles that you know physicians are you know basically are indoctrinated with during our training, mm-hmm. uh, and those ways exist in theory. They're just not in practice today. So you know, hospitals, professional organizations need to be talking about medical ethics, but not just ethics in the individual sense, but ethics in terms of the behavior of large healthcare corporations and finding creative ways to create more transparency, more accountability. I'm, again, this is obviously my, my area of, of personal interest. And I just like to, to plug the working on a book proposal. The, the working title is Hippocratic Capitalism. So pretty soon we should have the HippocraticCapitalism.com website up and running, or we'll put more ideas and information on this topic there. So. Right. Thank you so much for sharing your time and insight. And thanks again for being on the show. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate the opportunity.